Okay, we are recording. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Bowden. I am the managing editor for Fave Crafts and your host for today's class. We are so excited to have you joining us today for this very special class with Marie Segaris, Learn to Sew, Machine Sewing. Um, okay. Before uh, before we begin, I invite you all to uh, visit our website, favecrafts.com, for free crafting projects, tutorials, giveaways, and more. We also have a sewing website that is dedicated just to sewing, allfreesewing.com, so be sure to visit those and sign up for our free email newsletter. Um, we would love to welcome you into the Fave Crafts community and All Free Sewing community. Um, a few housekeeping items before we begin. If you get disconnected during the class, you can reconnect using the same link that you joined. You won't uh, interrupt anything. We are recording, like I said, so if you need to leave early or if you have any technological issues throughout the class, um, we will send you a link to the recording in 24 hours. We will also be posting uh, the class to our YouTube channel and on social media, so you will be able to watch at your leisure um, and rewind and fast forward whatever you want to watch if you want to watch it again. Um, we do have the Q&A feature enabled for our event, so if you have any questions, we will do our best to get to them along the way. Otherwise, we'll try to answer them towards the end of the class. Uh, the, the chat goes really fast, so if you just want to, you know, say, oh, this is so cool, or oh, I'm having so much fun, like, the chat is a great place to do that. But if you have a very specific question for Marie, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, I also wanted to share this introductory offer from our friends at We Like Sewing Digital Magazine. This is a brand new magazine that was launched January 2022. It publishes uh, 12 times a year. And for you guys today, uh, as our thank you offer, um, we are offering for $10, you can get um, a one-year subscription to We Like Sewing. Like I said, it publishes 12 times a year. You also get uh, access with your subscription to all of the back issues. All of the patterns are tech edited. It's completely ad-free. Tons of different patterns, inspiration. 75% um, off the retail price. You can get it for just $10. And the link here at the bottom, welikesewing.com slash webinar22 is how you can claim that deal. So um, if you are already a member, thank you. Uh, you can also gift this to a friend. Um, but this is a great way to take your sewing skills to the next step after today's free class. So um, on to the fun stuff. It is time to get started. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Marie Sagaris, our sewing expert for the day. She is going to lead the show and teach you all about how to use your sewing machine. So um, uh, without further ado, Marie, take it away. Hi, everybody. It's great to meet you, e meet you. I saw that there are some other folks from New York City uh, where I am currently located. And so that's very exciting. I do want to mention because I am in New York City, there is construction going on outside. So you may hear that occasionally as well as my cats. So a little bit about me, I blog at undergroundcrafter.com and I learned to sew as a child from my grandmother who was an amazing, amazing seamstress. She used to make clothes for us, uh, you know, things for the house, all kinds of really cool stuff. But I never really, uh, I didn't have a sewing machine for, you know, pretty much during most of my teenage years when I was a young adult. So I kind of gave up on sewing for quite a while. And then back in 2005, uh, two friends of mine and I, we decided that we would like to really, you know, get uh, to learn to sew again. And so we decided to take a quilting retreat and we got so excited into sewing at that point that I've been kind of addicted ever since. Um, and so I'm going to share a lot of things about a sewing machine today. And the sewing machine that I'm using, it's called the Baby Lock Jubilant. Most sewing machines are pretty similar, but you may find that your specific sewing machine is not exactly like mine. So one of the cool things about uh, to, you know, being a sewer in 2022, as opposed to 1980, is that you can usually find a PDF of your sewing machines uh, instruction manual, even if it's from the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, 
you can usually find that online. And so what I recommend is if you have an older sewing machine, you definitely want to search for the name of your, you know, the brand name of the machine, and then the model number, which is usually on the front of the machine, but not always, it might be on another location on your machine with, uh, with the serial number, which was, is often on the back of the machine. So then you want to search for that. And if you have no luck finding the manual that way, another alternative is to reach out to the sewing machine manufacturer. So in this case, mine would be uh, baby lock, you know, could be any other brand that your sewing machine is made with. And you just want to send them an email through the contact information on their website saying, I have this model. Uh, can you give me access to the PDF? And what you'll find is that most sewing machine companies, you know, because sewing machines are built to last, they can last 25, 30, even 40, 50 years. So they will have those on file and they would rather keep you kind of within the family of their sewing machine company. So they're usually very willing to send them to you. If you have a newer machine, it's a lot easier because usually the last 10 years or so of models are posted on the uh, website of the manufacturer. So again, you know, you would just Google or uh, type in that information about that manufacturer. So that's kind of the first step. And one of the things about uh, having that manual is that depending on how old your machine is, it may or may not be mechanized. So if it's not mechanized, there's probably some bits of information that you don't really have access to. And so uh, like, for example, you may not know which stitch uses which presser feet, and we'll talk about what presser feet are in a moment. So it's helpful if you to really get your hands on that manual. So I'm definitely going to recommend that that's an early step that you need to take. Um, so now that we've sort of covered that on the manual, let's talk a little bit about the machine itself. And uh, Jenny, I'm going to switch to the other camera. Um, so when you have your sewing machine, I'm going to turn this for a moment so you can see the side. And sorry for the squeaking, uh, but your machine has a wheel on the side, okay? And this is typically used to raise and lower the needle, okay? So this is an important wheel to have. Uh, and so that's something to know. Usually, almost always on the same, on the right side, you'll also have a power button. And um, most machines have a pedal, okay? So the pedal typically is installed on this right side as well. So you can see for my machine, the pedal inserts like this. And this may have different names. Uh, some machines, this is called a foot controller. Some it's called the pedal, but it's a little bit for those of you that drive, like driving a car. So uh, you would press down on this pedal and that would uh, actuate the sewing of the machine. And the harder you press down, it's like you're hitting the gas. So you're, you're adding more speed uh, to your sewing. And then when you lift up your foot off of the pedal, it's going to stop sewing. However, not everybody likes to sew in that way. So I'm actually going to take this out for a moment. If you have children, especially your pets, sometimes that can be challenging. Uh, so some sewing machines have another button, uh, like a start stop button. And that's when you, if your sewing machine has one like that, you can use that instead of the pedal. So you would press this button when you want to start sewing and press it again when you want to stop sewing. And that would be instead of the pedal. So you wouldn't use them both at once if your machine has a, a button like that. So I'm going to turn on the machine now. And by the way, uh, Jenny is kind of keeping track of the chat. So if, and of the Q and A. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask, right? So those questions, uh, I'll, you know, somebody will say them out loud. So talking about other parts of the machine, again, depending on the age of your machine, you may have the stitches that are available on the front of the machine. If not, you would be able to find them in your manual. And there are a couple of different types of stitches. So there are stitches that are called utility stitches. Uh, and those are basically the standard stitches, like for example, to sew in a straight line. So if you look at this machine here, they have several different options for sewing in a straight line. And then they even have an option for sewing in the straight line with two needles, right? So some machines have a twin needle capability. 
And then there's all of these other ones that would be more decorative. So for example, like this one that has like a kind of feathering and this one that looks a little bit like a maze, these are decorative stitches. So some sewing machines only have utility stitches and some have utility and decorative stitches. So again, when you look at your manual for your machine, we'll give you a better idea of what's available to you specifically. Uh, and so another thing to keep in mind with stitches is that different stitches may require different presser feet. So what is a presser foot? So uh, all sewing machines are pretty much set up where the sewing happens on the left side. On the right side, we have that wheel that I showed you, which you can use to lift the needle or put the needle down. This sewing machine also has a button that allows you to do that. So you can also use this button if you don't wanna use the wheel. Um, but the presser foot, there's typically a lever just to the right of where the sewing machine needle is. And this lever will lift the presser foot. And then depending on the type of your machine, there is a device in this one, it's a touch device. So I'm just gonna press it and the foot's gonna fall down. Okay, so I'm gonna show you this presser foot uh, for a moment. So this is a standard zigzag foot. And what that means is you can see this opening is kind of wide. For a zigzag stitch, it's gonna allow the needle to go in different directions. So you wanna be really careful when you start changing the stitches to make sure you have the right presser foot. That's because some of them only have an opening in the center. And if you were going to use a stitch that would cause the needle to do this, but there's only an opening in the center, what's gonna happen is that your needle is going to jam into the metal on your foot and break. Um, and when the needles break, it's bad of course, cause you have to put on a new needle, but also sometimes they can fall into the machine and damage the machine as well. So you wanna be very cautious about that. So again, with this particular machine, when you change the uh, stitch, which is done here with this knob, it may be different on your machine. It will actually tell you, I'm gonna try to find one with a different, will actually tell you the letter that is recommended for that presser foot for that type of stitch. So that's a helpful thing about today's kind of um, more computerized machines. If you have an older machine, that's what your manual is for. For every stitch, it's going to tell you which particular presser foot is, um, you know, is the right one to use. So thinking about presser feet, there's a couple of main types that you'll want for your machine. If they may have come with your machine or you may need to, to get them in addition. So for example, uh, this one, as I said, is a zigzag foot. We're gonna look at a couple of other types of feet. For people that are interested in quilting, there are a couple that you'll wanna keep in mind. So for quilting, most quilt patterns use a quarter inch seam. And so it can be difficult for people to get that, that perfect quarter inch seam. And so there are actually presser feet that can help you do that. So uh, some presser feet like this one here have a small guide. And so when you put this foot on, the fabric will actually abut against this guide. So it will keep you having a perfect quarter inch seam. So a foot like this is usually called a quarter inch foot or a quilt quarter inch seam foot or something like that. It's a little bit different names depending on your brand of sewing machine. And then another type that a lot of sewing, uh, a lot of people that quilt like is one like this, and I'm just gonna show it this way. You see that, I'm putting my finger behind it, you see how you can see through the opening for this presser foot? Um, this is called an open toe foot. And what this allows you to do is to essentially move the uh, your stitches around in kind of any sort of pattern you wanna make. So it doesn't have to be just straight line sewing. And so some quilters like this one as well, that's another popular one. Another popular one with quilters is one that has a, a guide ruler. And this is so that you can evenly space quilting lines. So for example, you might already have a quilting line here and then you would, uh, you would align this little ruler to that, that seam that you've sewn. And then all of your quilting lines will be equally distanced apart. So that's another popular type of foot for quilters. 
And then the last foot that I would recommend for quilters, but this one is not only for quilters, um, is called a walking foot, okay? And it's a lot bigger than the other feet. Usually you're gonna have to, it's not just gonna click on like that, that uh, zigzag foot did. You're usually gonna have to take out a tiny little screwdriver and attach it. But a walking foot is, as you can see, it has kind of its own, it has its own little feet here on the bottom. And those little feet push the fabric through, okay? So when you're sewing with, just one or two pieces of fabric, it's very easy for that to just flow through the machine. But when you start to add layers, like with a quilt, so typically a quilt, you're gonna have the front piece that's, um, the, that's usually pieced. So there's gonna be a whole bunch of seams. Then you're gonna have the batting, which uh, usually in the UK, you might call that the wadding, which is like the, the warm filling. And then you're gonna have a backing and all of those might be pieced. So there could be seams. So you're, you're trying to sew through maybe four, five, six layers, right? And so this foot will help push those layers through so that you are not fighting the machine, right? And that the sewing is going at the right pace for what the machine can handle and what the needles can handle. Um, another reason people like the walking foot, as I said, it's not just for quilting. A lot of people also use it for uh, sort of fabrics that are more challenging to work with. Like if anyone likes minky or cuddle, those very, very plush fabrics, because they're so thick and they're a little bit slippery, they can be hard to sew with. So a walking foot is great for that as well. Uh, so that, uh, and then I also have seen people use a walking foot for um, heavier fabrics like uh, home decor or upholstery fabrics that are a lot heavier, the walking foot is a great tool for that as well. So a lot of different types of sewing, you might need a walking foot. Um, so a couple of other feet I want to mention. If you plan to use vinyl, uh, you might want to use uh, something called a Teflon foot. So if you, let's say, want to do uh, vinyl for home decor or for, you know, making bags, or if you like to do cosplay, these are all reasons you might want to consider a Teflon foot. And this is basically a foot made of Teflon, and it helps when fabrics that are a little bit sticky, like vinyl and that doesn't want to move through the machine, it helps to allow this to move through the machine. If you don't use these specialized presser feet, sometimes what will happen is that the fabric won't move forward and you end up sort of fighting with the machine and the fabric and breaking needles and all kinds of things. And so that's why you would consider uh, a Teflon foot. And then I believe, hold on, let me check. Oh yes, I had more feet are in here. I was wondering what happened to those other feet. So I'm gonna put this one back on before we continue because I don't wanna lose it. Uh, and again, there's a small button at the back and then I align this little line and then it will go back in place. And since I'm done with that, I'm going to pull down this lever that I mentioned before uh, that raises the presser foot. So this machine has a little bit of a storage in the front and I have some additional presser feet in there that I wanna show people. If you're interested in making garments, you're probably gonna want a buttonhole foot. And so this is, a they, they all look a little bit different, but this is a kind of standard one. And you'll see that they're very, very long. And that's because the machine is going to kind of go back and forward, back and forward a bunch of times to make a buttonhole. If you look on the stitches here, there's a whole bunch of different, this machine has, I think, eight buttonhole options, right, of different shapes. And it's going to kind of go back and forth, reinforcing that area around where you're going to cut open for the buttonhole. And so this is one uh, type of foot, which is to make the button whole. And then there's another type of foot that helps you to sew the button in place. Okay. So if you plan to make a lot of garments, these are the type of feet you might want to look for. Another one that's really good for a garment sewist is uh, a zipper foot. Uh, and this is going to help you to install a zipper. Okay. And if you're gonna do a lot of sewing, you probably, uh, for garments, you probably also might wanna get a few more different feet depending on the type of garments you're gonna sew. So there's sewing feet for everything pretty much, uh, but those are sort of the main ones that as a 
new sewer you want to think about. So Sorry. far before, yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, could you reshow the very first one? I think it was the quarter inch one. Could you reshow that just one more time? Yes, sure. So the quarter inch foot, hold on a second here. Uh, it has kind of this metal piece that sticks out. I'm showing the bottom right now. And so when you go to sew, right? And I'll just put a piece of fabric so you can see what I'm talking about. The fabric will press up against this and it won't be able to go past it. And so that's how it keeps your seam a quarter inch. Now, if you don't have a quarter inch foot, because not everybody does, and you know, depending on what type of sewing machine you have, maybe there's not one available. There's another trick that I can teach you. Um, you would basically find the stitch that you're planning to use. So first you would switch over to the specific stitch and you see while I'm switching the stitches, right? The needle actually moves, okay? Because depending on the stitch, the needle needs to start in a different position. So you would choose the stitch that you're gonna use that you're gonna be piecing your, uh, your pieces together. And then you would lower the presser foot I'm sorry, you would lower the needle, also the presser foot, but the needle specifically. And then you would wanna take a ruler and measure a quarter inch from where this um, needle is. And then you can use that blue painter's tape and tape that across your machine, okay? And that's another way to give you a guideline for a quarter inch. Some machines also have the numbers uh, displayed. So mine here actually says quarter inch. So I can see that as well. Uh, and that's because this is a brand that has a lot of quilting machines, but some sewing machines don't have that. So if you don't have a quarter inch foot or it's not made, you have an older machine, they don't make one for it, then that's an alternative that you can do instead. Um, other questions about the feet before we move on from feet? It's Ashley. Um, we have a few people asking if you were to do like a hem on a pair of pants or a skirt, do you have a specific foot that you would recommend uh, the sewists use? Yeah, so a lot of people use, uh, there are hemming feet. So people do those for garment sewing. Um, also for garment sewing, uh, so um, a lot of people that sew garments also have a serger which is a type of machine. It's not a, exactly a sewing machine, but it's a machine that allows you to kind of encase the hem um, and the seams. Um, just like if you were, if you're wearing a store-bought garment right now, if you were to look at the seams, let's say by where your armpit is, you will see that the seam is enclosed, right? And so that's something that happens kind of automatically with the serger. There are feet that actually allow you to do that and they cut off the fabric as well. Sometimes they're called side cutter foots. They have different names from different companies, but that would be another good one for garment. Um, if you are interested in garment, garment sewing, uh, you, it could also be called an overcasting foot uh, because those type of stitches are usually called overcasting stitches. And so that would be another thing you'd wanna look for in a sewing machine is that it has overcasting stitches that you can seal up your um, seams with. Any other questions about the feet before we move on from the feet? Okay, so uh, we kind of covered the feet. Now I'm gonna talk about some other parts. So I'm gonna move this again. And you saw before that I took off this, uh, I, I showed that this here um, is, you know, a storage unit. It's actually removable. And when it's removed, this piece here is called the free arm. And so again, if you are interested in garments, you want to look for a sewing machine with a free arm. Why do you need a free arm? Well, when you sew things like sleeves or bags, you're going to have situations where you need to wrap the fabric all the way around, right? So I'm just gonna show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, and you can't do that if this part is closed, right? So for example, when you're making a sleeve, you might need to sew around the edge. When you're making a bag, you might need to sew around the edge. So any kind of sewing that involves a tube, you're gonna want to have a free arm. And so that's something that you can look for 
uh, in a sewing machine. And typically, just like this machine, the free arm isn't always exposed. The reason for that is because you want to have more sewing space when you're seaming uh, things that don't require the free arm. So oftentimes the free arm uh, is either surrounded by some kind of storage unit or a piece that can be removed. So that's pretty common if, uh, if you have a free arm. So while we're over here, uh, let's look at a couple of other things. Some machines have a thread cutter like this one. So this allows you to cut the thread. So for example, I've threaded the needle here and you see there's all this extra thread. If I wanted to tighten that, I can just cut it here. Or if I finish sewing, I can cut it there as well. So a thread cutter is another uh, type of thing. This machine has an automatic needle threader. It's already threaded, but what you would do is follow the instructions for how to thread the machine. And then you push this down and it uh, threads the needle. For those of us that have older eyes, um, the automatic needle threader is an is a amazing device because you're not fussing with um, the needle all the time. So a couple of other things, uh, most sewing machines on the top is the top thread and that is just like on your fabric, the thread that you're sewing with on the top is, is for the top stitch. And then on the bottom, you use something called a bobbin. Uh, and there are a couple of different types of bobbin systems. This one is what's called a drop-in bobbin. And what that means is that it's just like it sounds, you just drop the bobbin in. Some machines have a bobbin that is loaded into a case, and then that case is put into the machine. Typically, if you have a bobbin loading case, your bobbin is positioned like this uh, in the case, right? Um, and then the case is inserted into the machine at the front. Whereas with the drop-in bobbin, it's dropped in downwards like this. Um, so uh, that, and the bobbin is where the thread comes for the bottom of your fabric, okay? So you need both bobbin thread and top thread to sew, and you can use the same thread for both. OK, uh, and I actually prefer using the same thread for both. But if you're more of a decorative sewer, you may find that you want to use a different thread for the top and the bottom. Um, a couple things about thread and bobbins. Most modern sewing machines have a bobbin winder on the machine. This one is up here. And so there's two different ways you can thread the machine. One way leads down to the needle and one way will lead to this bobbin winder. OK. And so if you are winding a bobbin, you would put an empty bobbin up here. I didn't, I didn't have one right in front of me, but you'd put the empty bobbin here, you would wind it this way, and then you would put this in place. And then just like you're sewing, you would press on your control pedal or you would hit your start stop button, and then it will start spinning and this bobbin will fill with thread. And then when it's full, you would pull it out uh, and take it off. So that's the sort of bobbin thread. Um, a couple more things about thread, just that people should know. As the thread numbers get higher, this is sort of counterintuitive, the thread is thinner. So for example, a 50 weight thread is thinner than a 12 weight thread, which is thicker. So it's kind of opposites. Whereas with uh, needles, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, the sizes, you know, are a little bit more uh, understandable. As far as needles, there's a couple different kinds. Uh, most people, especially beginners, use what's called a universal needle. And just like the name suggests, it's pretty much use usable for any type of sewing. So a universal needle is your best bet if you are new to sewing and you're not sure if you need any specialized needles. The, the differences among needles have to do with two aspects. One is the eye of the needle, if it's wider to accommodate thicker thread. And then one is the point of the needle uh, and how the, the point is shaped, uh, as well as the shank, which is this sort of long piece here. So for example, earlier we talked about the Teflon foot for vinyl. If you were gonna sew with vinyl and leather, you'd probably wanna get a leather foot. Um, and that's because that's gonna pierce the leather a little bit more cleanly uh, than other feet. Similarly, let's say you love 
using upcycled denim. Who loves that? I love that. I have, you know, piles of jeans everywhere. I like making pro projects with them. If you want to use upcycled denim projects, you'd want to get a denim needle, okay? Because denim is a really thick fabric and you don't want it to wear out your other needles as quickly. Uh, are there any questions at this point before we kind of go on to our next, our next piece? One person was asking, um, we do have a few questions, um, but first, could you just center the machine? I know you're, you haven't really started selling yet, but we can't really see the stitches. Just move it over a little to the left. Yeah, perfect. That better? Uh, yes, great. Okay. Uh, Veronica is asking, is there a needle for thin or delicate fabrics? Yeah, so again, it would depend on each fabric, um, but there are needles for working with knits, for example, uh, which are sometimes thin and delicate. Uh, and then you can also change the needle size as well. So what I would say, um, if you are a newer sewist, <clears throat> you definitely, well, anybody, but especially if you're a new sewist, you want to become friends with your sewing machine dealer. Even if you have an old machine and you didn't buy it from them, you wanna get uh, familiar with your local sewing machine place. If you don't have a local sewing machine place, the great thing now is that you know since 2020, a lot of sewing machine dealers are online. So you wanna find a place that you, know, you feel you can trust and say to them, you know, this is what I wanna sew, what type of needles would you recommend? And the thing is they want you to sew well, right? They want you to make all these great projects and keep sewing and keep coming back to them and keep getting more stuff, right? So they're gonna tell you the right kind of needle for your project. Um, you probably have a harder time with that in a big box store because they don't always have uh, staff that are expert in sewing, right? So you wanna try to make that connection with the sewing machine store or with a fabric store. So they, they probably can, can guide you. You can tell them exactly the fabric you plan to use and they can tell you, you know, what type of thread you should use if there's any, unique presser foot you should use and what kind of needle. So you want to kind of make friends with them so you get the right supplies all the time. Okay, and then buttonholes might be a more advanced class question, but Veronica is wondering if you have an old machine, uh, would it be good to have a buttonhole foot? I mean, can you just talk maybe about buttonhole? So, so in order to, yeah, sure. In order to have a buttonhole foot, you want your machine to have some kind of buttonhole stitch. So it's not necessarily about how old the machine is. It's about what the idea behind the machine was. So if you think about different types of sewists, like I've talked about today, garment sewing, quilting, um, home decor, bag making, all of those things are sewing, but the type of sewing that's done is a little bit different in terms of the fabrics and so on. And so if you had an older sewing machine that was mostly made for garments, it's very much very likely to have a buttonhole stitch, right? And so we talked about these are, you can, I don't know how well people can see them, but they're, they're sort of open in the center, right? And it's just like if you think about a store-bought outfit that you have with a button, that there is like a reinforced stitching around where the hole is and then a space in the middle where it's cut open, right? Um, so if you think about that, that's what the foot is for. You would have to actually use the foot in conjunction with a buttonhole stitch. So the question isn't, is my machine too old for a buttonhole foot? The question is, does my machine have buttonhole stitches? And so if it has buttonhole stitches, then yes, definitely you would need a buttonhole foot. Um, but if it doesn't have buttonhole stitches, then it doesn't make sense to have the foot because there's no real way that you could um, force the machine to create the buttonhole in that particular way. Does that make sense? I think so. She says that hers does not have a buttonhole stitch, but. Uh. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we all kind of um, have our sewing wish list. So maybe that's on the wish list for your next, your next machine, right? Okay. Um, I have one more question and then we are about to the halfway point. So maybe we can, okay. we can do one question yeah. and then would this be a good spot for an intermission? Definitely. Okay. So let's go with the question. Okay. So Susan says, is it okay to put the thread on the bobbin winder and sew that way, or is it better to keep the mm. thread on the sideways thread holder in the back? That's a great question. So most machine problems um, somehow come back to thread. Okay. <laughs> so, so when you think about um, threading your machine, you really want to use the top spool threader for the top. And that's because 
there's a couple of things about that. And you also want to follow the instructions in your manual or which may be in a newer machine, actually like a baby lock has actual uh, little graphics that show you what to do. Like you can see this one here and there's others on the top that show you how to thread it because even small things like putting the thread on in a different direction can affect the thread tension. So if it says, for example, my machine, you're supposed to have the thread coming from underneath the spool. Let's say I did it the opposite way with the thread coming over the spool, that might lead to tension problems later when I'm sewing. So what I mean by tension is that the top stitch and the bottom stitch don't match up, okay? And so what you end up is like, uh, like big strings coming out of the bottom or the top stitches look, you know, wacky, all kinds of weird stuff happens. And when those kind of things happen, a lot of lint gets stuck in your machine. And then if you don't clean your machine, that lint builds up and it becomes basically a, like a danger to your machine functioning correctly. So I wouldn't put um, a full spool of thread on the bobbin because it's not designed to hold a full spool, full spool of thread. And so it would probably change the tension too much. So that's why you wanna use the top thread on the top and the bobbin on the bottom and not sew from the bobbin winder. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, depending on the size of your spool, there's a spool cap and you wanna use the cap that is bigger or the same size of the spool that you have. So for example, I have a couple of other spool caps for like smaller and bigger spools of thread. And the reason for that is the same, it's to kind of keep that spool in position so that it's not rattling and shaking and therefore a messing with your tension. So I hope that answered your question. And then I know we're gonna take a break now. Yes, that was a great answer, she said. Thank you. Um, okay, so we are going to take a quick little intermission. Um, so if you guys would like to get up and stretch your fingers, I know we haven't really, you know, gotten started with the sewing yet. It's just been a lot of information so far, but I hope you guys are having a great time. Marie is going over some lots of great information today. So um, I wanted to just share with you guys some upcoming crafting classes that we are offering through Fave Crafts. Um, on Tuesday, May 24th, we will be doing Learn to Crochet a Granny Square that is taught by our friend Marley Bird. And then on June 7th, we have a Learn to Knit class also with Marley Bird. And then on June 21st, learn to knit a hat. So all three of these classes are free. So you can sign up at the link here at the bottom of your screen, favecrafts.eventbrite.com. Um, so yeah, we, we, this is our first sewing class that we've done. So usually we've been doing, you know, a lot of knitting and crochet classes. So we have these great knitting and crochet classes coming up and then um, hopefully we will be doing some more sewing classes as well. So uh, if you guys want to uh, learn a new skill outside of sewing, we have some great options for you. Uh, and then just one more time, I wanted to remind you of this great offer we have from our friends at We Like Sewing Magazine. You get 75% off the retail price. It's normally $49 for a one-year subscription, but uh, for you guys today, we have this introductory offer prepared for you for joining our class today. So you can get 75% off. You get a one-year subscription for just $10. Uh, like I said, it publishes 12 times a year. So once a month, you will get a digital copy of this brand new magazine. It's completely ad-free. All the patterns are tech edited, uh, lots of different types of patterns. As you can see on these covers here, you have pillows, blankets, wearables, accessories, lots of different things to choose from. So um, all right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the intermission and took advantage of it, went to the bathroom, got something to drink. I am going to go back to Marie now and we will get started with our sewing machine. Great. Um, so my first uh, kind of big tip I want to share is I'm going to show you this little junky piece of fabric and it has threads all over it. Um, I use just a little scrap piece of fabric. Um, whenever I change something on my sewing machine. So if I added a new needle, if I uh, wound the thread again, if I um, change the stitch, if I change the presser foot, I just use this little scrap piece just to check to make sure everything is sewing 
the way I want it to before I sew right onto my project. Because sometimes when we make those changes, something in the machine can change. So if you have a little scrap piece of fabric, you can just fold it over and then it will be just like two layers of fabric. Or in this case, I have two small scraps. Um, and so the first thing you wanna do is again, you're going to lift that lever that raises your presser foot. If your needle isn't already up, you're gonna to wanna to even either use the wheel on the right of your machine, or if you have a needle up down button. And then right now we're not concerned with seams. So you can really put this little junk piece of fabric wherever you want. And then you're gonna lower down the presser foot. Okay. And that's gonna keep, uh, and so your fabric should be sort of, um, well, your needle, right, should be kind of at the back end of your fabric uh, because you want it to sew going forward. So when you sew, for those of you who've never sewn before, your fabric is gonna move towards the machine, okay? So uh, you don't want your needle to be in front of the back piece of your fabric or that part's not gonna get sewn, okay? So I'm gonna use, uh, so another thing I should mention, most sewing machines have speeds, especially the newer ones. And typically, you know, like one, this one, one play button is the slowest, two is the middle and three is the fastest. If you are new to sewing, even if you're impatient, I strongly recommend that you start on the slower bit because it's much easier to see what you're doing and correct mistakes if you have them. So I'm just gonna do some practice stitches um, to make sure that everything is okay before I get started. And then I'm gonna hit stop. I'm going to lift my needle. I'm going to lift my presser foot with this lever. And then, as I said, I have a, a, a thread cutter on the side. If you don't have that, you can just grab a scissor, right? And just cut the thread. Okay, so what I'm looking for here is, this is the part I just sewed. The stitches look very even. And then I'm gonna check the back and the stitches also look even. So that means I'm not worried that anything is wrong. If I had uh, maybe stitches only on one side, one side the stitches are, you know, loops are coming out of them. Then the first thing you check is the thread uh, to make sure that the thread is properly, you know, um, gone through your machine, whether it's the top thread or the bottom thread. And then if that's fine, then you're ready to sew. So I asked people, uh, to bring a piece of fabric with um, some stabilizer on the back. If you were able to do that, let's start with that piece of fabric, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try some of the decorative stitches that your machine has, okay? And everybody's stitches, everybody's machine is a little bit different. So I'm just gonna line it up again, like I said, so that the needle will be at the edge of the fabric. Um, for this particular thing, this is what's called a stitch sampler. And when you get a new sewing machine, it's a great way to check out all the different stitches, try the different feet and all that good stuff. So because of that, uh, this is not a piece that I'm going to necessarily sew into something else. So I'm not concerned at this point with the start and end seam. So I'm going to uh, choose a different stitch. Let's see here. Try to find one that's more of a zigzag. Okay, so I chose a zigzag stitch and I'm letting the machine tell me, you know, how far the stitches should be apart and the stitch length. Okay, so the stitch length is how far, how long the stitch is and the stitch width is how wide the stitch is. Every stitch may not allow you to adjust that. Okay, and again, also if you have an older machine, sometimes you have to make that adjustment yourself and that's where the manual is helpful because it will tell you what is the correct um, width and length for that particular stitch. Marie, so I have my, uh, real quick, Sadie yeah. is wondering, and maybe you just answered it, what is the best length to have the stitch on as a starter? That's a great uh, question. So I would go with whatever stitch is recommended by your machine for that particular stitch. I would use that length first. Um, so for example, I have used, I always use the standard length, except when I sew with certain fabrics that require a different length. So for example, earlier I mentioned Minky or Cuddle. It's a very, very plush fabric. You've probably seen it on kids' blankets and stuffed toys and things like that. Um, because of the way that that fabric works, you usually would have to change the stitch length. But today, uh, hopefully we're working with cotton fabrics, which are pretty easy to work with. They don't require 
accommodation. So you should be able to use whatever stitch length that your machine is. Okay, so now I'm gonna hit with this particular stitch. And what I'm really doing here- Marie, you cut out for just a second, so I don't oh, know. Oh, sorry. I said I, I hit the start stop and I'm just trying this stitch. Now you'll notice I have it on slow and I'm not pushing the fabric, right? I'm just holding the fabric and guiding it. Um, if you go at faster speeds, you have to have a lot more control of the fabric because it's more likely that something will go wrong as you're going faster, right? So I'm gonna speed it up a little just so people can see what I'm talking about. So as I go faster, uh, it's possible that, you know, this won't be going straight and things like that. So you have to pay a lot more attention. Okay, so I'm just gonna go to the end and you should be doing this too at home if you have a uh, fabric and a machine with you that you can use. And then when you're done, again, you're gonna lift the needle and then you're going to use this lever to lift your presser foot. And then, uh, as I said, you're just gonna want to cut the cut here. All right, and what we're basically doing is we're just trying some different stitches, okay? So on your machine, you may have more stitches than me, you may have less stitches than me, but we did one sort of straight across with one stitch, and then um, you'll wanna change uh, to another stitch. Again, you're gonna put the presser foot down. Um, you don't have to start with the needle down because it will automatically go down when you start sewing, but it is helpful if you're not sure uh, if your fabric is too far or far enough to put the needle down because you can't sort of push it behind the, the needle, right? So if you're not, if you're kind of not sure, oh, is my fabric in the right place? Then it might be better to start with your needle down because the fabric can't push past it. I hope that makes sense. So now I'm gonna just switch to another different stitch um, that also uses the same uh, foot. And I'm going to, uh, again, just use the start stop or the foot pedal, whatever you're using and kind of sew that across. And so if you have a lot of contrast between your fabric and your thread, you're gonna see these a lot more vividly than if you don't have a lot of contrast between. And again, what you wanna do is at the end of each time that you do this, you're gonna want to check uh, the back piece, right? And just make sure, again, that you're not getting any weird, you know, thread action on the back, okay? So on the back, you can see that, I know this is a little hard because white on white, but you can see that the stitches are really even on the back and on the front, okay? And so this sampler that you would make just with all the stitches on your machine, um, it's helpful for a couple of reasons. First of all, this little picture of the stitches doesn't really always give you an idea of what it actually looks like in reality. So having, um, you know, a clearer uh, set of stitches, I think is, is helpful. And they also make kind of cute decorations. So for example, what I've done is I've taken these five inch pieces and I've sewn a couple of stitches and then I put them in those three and a half inch embroidery hoops and they make really cute like holiday decorations or wall art or things like that. So even though it's just, you just sewed in a straight line, that's all you did, um, it still looks really nice, right? And so also, like I said, you can use it to refer back to, like maybe now you're making a project and you're thinking, which stitch do I want to use? Mm, let me look and see what they really look like in real life. And the reason we put the stabilizer on the bottom is because we're not sewing this fabric to anything. It's just one piece of fabric. That's to keep it from flopping all over the place and it, to kind of make it feed through the machine a little bit easier. Uh, are there any questions about that? Um, not about that necessarily, but we actually have a couple of questions about tension, such as yes. like, could you give like a very brief uh, description of the different types of tension dials or how to like fix tension when you're sewing? Yeah, so um, the way that I, so tension dials vary a lot on different machines, but basically the tension is kind of the combination of the top spool 
and the bottom spool and then how long the stitches are. So kind of all of that stuff working together creates the tension. And so remember at the beginning, I had this little junk piece of fabric. Um, the best way to, to start fixing the tension is to actually sew onto something and then look at what changes. So let's say for example, you use this piece and like I said, your the bottom thread is, is loopy or something strange that doesn't seem right to you. Then I would start by first uh, re-threading the machine, make sure that you followed the instructions for threading the top spool. Um, make sure, like I said, that the cap is the right size for the, the spool. So if you have a really thin spool, right? Um, like for example, if you had a spool like these, which are much more narrow, right? You would want a thinner, uh, smaller spool cap to keep this in place. This big spool cap, it would probably be jiggling around, right? Um, so similarly, if you had a big, big thread like this, you'd want a wider spool cap to keep it in place. So that would be my first step. And then the second step, I would uh, check the bobbin. So same thing, I would wind the bobbin uh, or I would reinsert the bobbin thread and make sure that it's correct. And then if you're still having problems, that's when you wanna adjust the tension or the stitch length to kind of try. And again, after each change, you're gonna try it out on your little scrap fabric. And so sometimes, you know, you may need to make notes for your machine. Hey, uh, if I'm using this type of thread, you know, when I'm using a 50 weight thread, I need to keep the stitch length on this, or I need to use this type of thread in the bobbin. Um, and that is actually one of the reasons that I like to use the same thread in the bottom and the top, because a lot of times tension problems uh, happen because of different stitch, different thread um, weights, and they sort of move at a different speed. So it's a lot easier for a beginner to use the same in the top and the bottom. I hope that answered that question. So uh, any other questions before we move on? Okay, so now we're gonna practice sewing two pieces together in a straight line. So um, these are just two little squares that I have cut. Uh, and so if you look at the fabric, right, you can see one side is more vibrant than this other side. This side is plain and this side has uh, print on it, right? And so the side with the print on it is the right side or the front side. And the plain side is the back side or the wrong side. And um, usually what's gonna happen is that uh, on most fabrics, this is kind of obvious, but not on every fabric, okay? So then sometimes you're kind of making the decision, what do you think is the right side? So when you're sewing, generally speaking, the right sides are gonna be together. So you're gonna be looking at the wrong side. And you know, I'm doing, uh, I've been sewing a long time, so I don't always necessarily pin my work, but I do recommend it for beginners because it keeps the pieces together. And also depending on the type of fabric that you're using, it may be more necessary. So for example, any sort of slippery fabric, you definitely need to pin it. So you can use pins or you can use uh, wonder clips, which are like little small clips. Um, no matter what you use, you always want to remove the pin or the clip before your needle gets to it, okay? If your needle hits a pin or a clip, it's very likely that your needle will break. And as I mentioned before, when your needle breaks, often that damages your machine, okay? So I have these clips on the edge that I'm going to sew, okay? And I have the two right sides together and the edges are basically lined up. Now I'm gonna go back to not a decorative stitch, just a plain old straight stitch, okay? Um, and I'm going to lift my presser foot lever again, uh, and I'm going to line up the edge. Oops, ah, catastrophe. I'm gonna line up the edge with the edge of my fabric, okay? And I'm gonna take off the first clip because it's just, uh, no, now that I have the fabric there, I'm gonna line up the edge of the presser foot. So the right edge of the presser foot with the, the right edge of my fabric, okay? And when that's in place, I'm gonna lower my presser foot and then I'm just using a straight stitch and you can do this as well. You can sort of follow along, okay? And I'm gonna slow down the pace because I have these clips, so I don't wanna bump into any of them. So I'm gonna start, okay? 
And as it gets closer to the clip, I'm gonna stop. Now, when you stop, it doesn't affect the line of your sewing in any way, so that's okay. I'm gonna pull that one out, and then I'm gonna keep going, okay? And the same thing, when I get closer to the next one, I'm gonna stop as well. And I think the clips are a little easier for a lot of beginners. First of all, you don't have to worry about uh, pricking yourself with the pins, but also because they're so big, it's a lot harder to accidentally sew over them, which as I said, can really damage your machine. Okay, and then I'm gonna keep sewing to the next one and then I'm gonna pause and keep on. Now, obviously, if you feel confident sewing, you can move a lot faster than this, but it's not necessary to speed stow, especially the first time, right? So now I'm gonna pause again, pull this out, and I'm gonna go all the way to the edge. Now, if this was a seam that was gonna be kind of the end of my project, I wanna make sure that I reinforce it. So the way that I can do that is when I get to the very end, I'm gonna stop, and then I'm gonna reverse. On this machine, there's a button to do that. On some machines, you would do that, uh, there's a like a, it would say reverse and you actually click on that reverse um, and then you would still uh, pedal. So usually three stitches back and forward is, is good to reinforce. So I'm doing three reverse and then I'm gonna keep going straight ahead. And then when I get to the end, I'm gonna stop, gonna lift my needle, uh, lift my uh, presser foot lever, and then I'm gonna clip my thread here. So if you see at this edge here, you can see that it's a little bit darker, right? Because it's been reinforced there. And then now you open the seams, okay? Now the way that you want to uh, make this a little easier to work with is you'll always wanna press the seams in one direction usually. Some patterns will call for spreading the seams like this on the back, uh, but mostly, you'll want to press in one direction. And typically if you're using two different color fabrics, you wanna to press towards the darker fabric and that's because the seam will be less visible. And that's pretty much how you sew in a straight line. Are there any questions right now? We have a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. One is, do you only need to backstitch at the end? Yeah, so I would recommend backstitching at the very beginning and at the very end if that piece is not going to be covered again in a seam. So for example, if you were quilting, right, you might make this piece and then you would attach more pieces up here. So you don't have to um, reinforce those pieces because they're also gonna be sewn over. But if let's say this was the end of your project and this is the last time you're making a seam, then yes, I would reinforce at the start and the end of that seam. This machine actually has a reinforcement stitch, this little circle. You can just press that and it goes back and forward. Uh, you know, if some machines have that again, like the newer machines, but with the older machines, you wanna usually do th three stitches forward, three stitches back should be enough to reinforce. Other questions? Yeah, thank you for answering that. Um, Veronica is asking, on machines that do not have reverse, is it okay to do the back stitch with the needle wheel? Yeah, so usually, and that's why it's really helpful to get your uh, manual because it will explain to you how that machine is supposed to be reinforcing. So if the machine is supposed to be reinforcing with the hand wheel, um, or if there's another method, uh, some, some older machines also have like a reinforcement stitch. So you might actually switch to that stitch and that stitch might automatically go forward and reverse. So you'll wanna check um, the older models, if you can, finding the manual be your friend and tell you exactly how your machine recommends doing reinforcing. I wanted to just chime in that we do only have a few minutes left. So if you mm -hmm. want to just kind of start wrapping things up, Marie. Yep, definitely. So, I mean, I think at this point we've sewed a straight line. We've tried some sample stitches. We've covered kind of the basics of the machine. Um, and at this point, you know, I really just wanted to answer questions people have. If people don't have questions, you know, I'll share some other tips, but if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. So if you, 
Yeah, I was okay. going to say we do have um, just a few specific questions and then we can yep. kind of wrap things up. Rochelle, for wondering, where is the best place to get your model of sewing machine? I think a lot of people are jealous of your sewing machine. Uh, okay, I love this machine. I'm um, just briefly because it's portable. Like you saw, I had the handle. It's very lightweight. It's like 13 pounds to, and it's a compact. So I live in a one bedroom apartment. You may have figured this out already just from the layout, but because of that, um, I love a, sewer, a smaller machine. So you can get this from any baby lock dealer and online, there are quite a few. It's called the Jubilant. Um, and I have a review of it uh, on my YouTube. If you wanna, you know, there's a link to stores that you can get it from. But um, any sewing machine dealer that is a baby lock dealer would have it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's where you can get it online. Or of course, if you have a local sewing dealer, you can go into the store as well. Um, but you know, things to look for if you have small space and you want a more compact machine is to look for uh, this length here. Um, that will tell you kind of how big it is uh, because the depth usually is, is a little bit more variable. So like you can see here, it, it comes in and here it's thicker. So I would look for the length here if you're looking for a portable machine. And if you want a machine that you can take on the go to sewing classes and everything, you want to look at the weight as well. And usually any machine under 15 pounds is considered port portable. Anything over that, you're not really supposed to be lifting it because it's too heavy. Okay. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, we are out of time. So for those of you, there are some additional questions in the chat and the q and I'm going to try to get to those after the class, but um, we are going to wrap things up. Like I said, we are recording this class. So you will all receive a link to the recording in 24 hours. So if you want to rewind, watch something again, um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. But I do want to just go back to um, my screen real quick here and wrap things up with you guys. So again, my name is Jenny Bowden, and we were joined and taught by the wonderful Marie Segarra. So be sure to follow her on social media. She's got tons of great videos on her YouTube channel as well. And then if Jenny, you your, your screen is not oh. showing if you're trying to show oh, yes. something. There That's we go. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Marie Sagaris was our teacher today. So thank you, Marie, for leading the show and teaching us all about our sewing machines. Um, be sure to follow her on social media and on her YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Jenny Bowden. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. There is my email address right there on the screen. And then one more time, this deal from our friends at We Like Sewing, you can get 75% off the retail price. So just $10. It's a great deal. It's a wonderful magazine. Um, they launched earlier this year in January. They publish every single month. So tons of great patterns every single month um, for just $10. So um, that is all. Like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out um, and we will try to get us to some of these questions that were unanswered um, via email. So thank you guys for joining us today and we hope to see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day and happy sewing.